Conversation on. We stayed up kind of late. I'm three hours behind schedule anyway, but but we uh, talked till the wee hours of the morning, and God dropped some things in my heart last night um, as just where I am in ministering what God is trying to do in my life that Uncle Huff uh, affirmed and confirmed. And so I am um, just glad to be here um, this morning with a word um, to share with you guys. Um, before I pray, I just want you to take notice of something that's uh, particular and important. Um, to have Uncle Huff stand up this morning and just hear him talk about uh, the tree that's in the street, yeah. right? Like, I just think, like, that's, I'm, I'm always being taught by God. It's like, that's what it means to be a pastor set in a city um, to oversee um, a God's people as an under-shepherd. Like, you are concerned about everything that is happening in the city. It's not just Sunday and, you know, church. It's like, no, but this is my city. Like, God called me to this city, and I am concerned with its welfare um, and its health and prosperity. And so I just believe that as a church, I just think that has to continue to give us cues that, hey, it's not just about us. Right, right? As a church, we are a people who are supposed to be paying attention to everything that's surrounding the city that can impact or hinder. Just for him to say, you know, buses go up that street. This thing, he like, I want the kids to get to school with no problem. Just think, like, that's a small detail, but that is how God looks at it. We look at stuff like, oh, that's just too small, too little. He ain't paying attention to that. But God is saying, I'm surveying everything, and you, you do not know um, the timing God walks in. Just imagine uh, the bus has to stop or take another route, and what if that route right there leads them into a space where somebody not paying attention and the accident happens? Right, But if they was able to go straight through, the timing that they would be in would be in a whole other time frame. I think like that. A God who's sovereign in control of everything will make us pay attention to the little, de little details because everything matters with him. There's no throwaway moments. I feel like I'm already preaching right now. <laughs> God, God pays attention to everything, and that's part of what we're going to talk about today. God is looking. He is looking. He sees. He hears the cries of people's hearts. He sees the despair that they're going through, and he is waiting on the church to be awakened to look at the world as he looks at the world so that we might engage on his behalf. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Thank you for the gift that it is to, um, to be in this um, worshiping community that you have gathered. Um, we, we give you thanks for all of the mothers that are here um, this morning, God, for those who have, have supported and nurtured and developed and uh, corrected and been rocks in the midst of families to keep things stable. God, we thank you uh, for their great love. We thank you for their undying love. And so we give you praise uh, for them this morning, God. We thank you as well, Father, that you um, would speak to us today from your word, that you might awaken us as a called out people who who are really your representation in this world. We are your witnesses in this world. We are those who have been brought to see the glory of the king. And Father, it is, it is um, upon us that we might go forward in this world uh, seeking the loss that they might uh, come into contact with you, that their hearts might be righted in relationship through Christ. And so, Father, bless us in these few moments that we have uh, to dive into your word, that you will speak as only you can. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. As we think about this text um, from Mark 5, I believe that it creates for us the missional impulse of God, right? The text has a story in it. There is a life that is entangled in the story, but really what I believe Jesus was doing is he was trying to teach his disciples of not only what his mission was, but what their mission must be. He wasn't just trying to say, hey, I came to do this, just tag along with me. Jesus was saying, hey, I came to do my work, and I'm actually going to show you that when I leave, this is the work I'm leaving for you to do. We're not going to just go in the temple and stay in the temple all day. Oh, if you don't hear that right there, we're not going to just come in the building and stay in the building all day. Don't nobody go to the gas station and just park there. You go to the gas station, get some gas, and you get up out of there to go do something with the gas you got in your tank. 
The church is a place that we come to be refilled, re-encouraged, reignited, that we might be about the mission of the Father. That's what Jesus came to do. He was down here on a mission on purpose. He came down here to do what the Father sent him to do, and his mission was simply this. I came to seek and to save that which is lost. I didn't come to protest. I didn't come uh, to fix every law. I didn't come to make everything right in the earthly sense. I came, and I'm after human hearts that are lost, that have been snatched by the enemy. I came to get my people back. And he said, listen, if, if the church is not about that, I don't know what y'all got because y'all don't got a church. You got a social club. You got something else. And that's why so many churches get filled with drama and, and infighting is because they're not doing the mission. It's, 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 it's almost like eating and eating and eating, but never doing anything to work off that energy that you got. You just, you get, you get some kind of way that you shouldn't be. So God says, I'm pouring this into you so that you might go pour this out. Listen to this, you, not just the preacher, not just the people who get up front in leadership. Listen, there's a lane that you're going to walk that only you can walk. There's some people that you can get in contact with that only you can get in contact with. And Jesus said, you tell them. <laughs> Don't go call the pastor right now. That's your assignment. The church, the called out people of God, this is a church that we're worshiping in, but the church is the people. Church didn't happen until y'all showed up this morning. It's the people who have been called out by Christ and who gather around his name and his witness who are the people now who hold the testimony, and listen to this word, the power to change something. If we ever going to see change happen in our world in the way God intends, it's not going to happen in the judicial system. It's not going to happen in the political arena. It's going to happen when the church wake up. When the church get busy and go out into the highways and the byways, listen to this, compelling people to come to Christ first. Don't invite them to church yet. <laughs> get them to Jesus. Jesus will get them to the church. Because <laughs> without Jesus, I don't got a reason to come sit in here too long because I don't understand what's talk what y'all talking about. No way. But when I get him and he get real with me in the way I need him to, listen to this, somebody show me where the church at. <laughs> show me where they talking more about him that I might get filled up with more in him because listen to this, that's what I've been missing my whole life. I've been waiting for him to arrive. I've been looking for it in the money, in the weed, in the women, in the men. I've been looking for him all over the place and couldn't find him, but now I do. I see where he is and that, that, that thirst that's been deep down in my soul, that hunger that's been deep down on the inside, man, I found out only he could fulfill that. So now I need to come to the gas station, <laughs> fill my tank, <laughs> so I can run the race that I've been called to run. Listen to this, that my mama can't run this race for me. When I stand before the king, he's not going to ask me about nobody else's assignment. He's going to ask me, did I do what he told me to do? And that's the only way to leave this world. Jesus, when it was time for him to get ready to leave, he was already in that place and listen, Father, I have done what you told me to do. Is that where you are? Are you thirsting to do his will? Are you praying that he would open up your eyes and your heart to see the little details, to see the people who are pushed off into the margins, listen to this, that live on your block, <laughs> that work with you in the cubicle next to you? The people who, who, you, who you associate with, are you seeing where they are in life and seeing, God, how might I enter into their life that you might get the glory out of their lives? You hold the key. The church, we've been given keys that allow people access into the kingdom. We don't save anybody, but we got the message. We are pointers. We point people to the one who does save. And so that is our assignment, and I believe that's what Jesus is teaching in the Mark passage. Think about it. This actually starts in Mark chapter 4. Jesus is on the shore teaching them about the importance of the word of God. Jesus starts teaching, and he starts talking about the seed, and it falls on good ground and stony ground and rocky ground and, and all of these things, and things are trying to take that seed out of the ground and stop it from growing, which is why the saints got to be busy steady watering. Listen, Ooh. <laughs> I feel God right there. I feel like that's where the pressure is right there. Like, we, we, we just drinking, but we ain't watering nobody. We getting and getting and getting and getting, and he said, nah, you, you, don't you have enough yet? Don't you have enough to go tell somebody, listen to this, what I've done for you? To go give out what you've received. Freely you have received, freely you ought to give. Like Jesus says, he, he came to give his life away. 
He didn't come down here continually asking God to give him stuff. He wanted to be about the mission and the will of God in this world. Listen to this. Jesus was down here living heaven's mission. See, that's what it looks like for us, to be a people who live in this world who are so focused on the agenda of heaven and not our own agenda that we begin to do what we actually have been called to do is to be his hands and feet. Just think about it, though. Jesus is, he is the brain of the operation. He's the head. We are the body. Now, just imagine you stand up in the mirror on the, in the morning and you, in your mind, you saying, brush my teeth, but your, your arm don't move. You looking in the mirror and you telling yourself, arm move, brush your teeth. But your arm still there, not responding to what the brain is thinking. You would be like, something wrong right now. Now what if Jesus is saying, go, go tell them, and you still being still? <laughs> Jesus is like, hold on a second, you are my reflection, you are my image, you should be doing what I am commanding you to do, not standing still, you ought to be going. That's what the Bible said, not stand therefore, go ye therefore. Because I've, I've triumphed over everything. Listen, there should be nothing that blocks us from stepping into the will of God, following out his command. And so the first thing that Jesus does, as you see in this passage, in Mark chapter 5, verse number 1, Mark chapter 5, verse number 1, it basically says that when they got to the other side, like Jesus was going, they got in a boat to go to the other side. Now, they went through a storm to get there. Let me say two things on that. First of all, Jesus didn't have a boat. He got in somebody else's boat to go do his thing. And that's what he want to do with us. Jesus want to climb in your boat, your life, and begin to do his thing with your life. And he'll take you through some storms, listen to this, to get you to the destination he tried to get you to. Because listen to this, as long as he is on the boat, he said, you all right. This boat can't sink if I'm on the boat. <laughs> I am life itself, and if I'm with you, listen to this, you can't fail or fall. Not fall away from what I, because I'm holding you up. And so he says, listen, I want to get into your life and do my thing with it. I surrender all. Like, that, that, that has to be the cry of our heart. Everything that I have belongs to you now. Let Jesus get into that, that he might do his thing with it. It says, now, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes, and when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. And this is important, I believe. First of all, the Gerasenes is not Jewish territory. It's not church land. Where Jesus is going, it wasn't safe and neat and cushiony. It wasn't, um, it wasn't of the Jewish faith. It wasn't people who believed in God. Jesus went over there to the outside. Jesus went to the margin. Jesus went to the block. Jesus went to the neighborhood. Listen to that. There's some people over there that's waiting on me. And if I don't show up to them, if I don't show up for them, listen, they're going to stay right there and die in their misery and their pain. Part of what I believe Jesus wants to have happen is there are many people who are crying out for him, saying, God, if you're real, would you show up? Show me that you're real. Show me that you're paying attention. And Jesus is like, well, that's why he's trying to wake us up. Because the church has to be his hands and feet to go over there by the impulse of Christ to go meet the needs of somebody else. And what will happen in that person's heart will be like, you was listening. Jesus did hear me. Jesus is not going to show up out the sky. He's going to show up through his church. He's going to show up through his people who will begin to meet the needs and see the loss and the hurting and the broken and who step into that place. Jesus went on purpose to the margins. Now, it's, 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 it's amazing because... I believe the disciples had to be scared because, listen to this, you see a man who's coming out the graveyard approaching the boat. Now, now and the other writers say that this man got out of there coming out the grave, and he was, he was one, he looked crazy, he was demon-possessed, but secondly, he was naked. I just, this man, you just came out of a storm. The storm was already bad enough, but in the storm, I got a bigger sense of who Jesus is, so I'm kind of like, man, we riding with the king right now. Like, who is this man that the wind and the waves obey him? And now as soon as the boat gets over to the other side, we see a crazy man coming, so to speak. Now, this crazy man is, is not as crazy as we think. This crazy man, I believe, is the reality of what it looks like when sin has been awakened in you and you see your true state. I believe he is a representation of a sinner who needs to be saved. Listen to this. Just think, man started out in the garden. Everything was all right. 
And because of the deception that happened through the enemy and the fall of man, listen to this, this brother is standing now in the position where sin going to lead all of us. In the graveyard, at a dead end, around dead things with no hope and no life, wondering and crying, saying, is this what life really is going to lead to? His options have been cut off. His relationships have been cut off. He's been left to himself. Listen to this. The Bible talks about him cutting himself and hurting himself. That's what we see all in the city. I see in Oakland right now, I've been doing a Bible study in Juvenile Hall for the last five weeks. And what I see in this place is a representation of this man. I see young men who have, who have been pushed to the margins, left to themselves, who tried to self-medicate themselves and figure out a way to find happiness and hope in this world, and they keep getting let down. And in this place, I'm hearing the cry of their heart. I'm hearing where they are. And God said, that's why I sent you in here, so that you might speak the word of life to them right at while they're in the graveyard, so to speak. That even though you feel like this might be your end, what if this is your beginning? What if this is the place God wanted to bring you to the end of yourself that you could see that you can't make it without him and that he would send somebody in with the word, not about themselves, but about Christ who raises dead things that you might have hope. The church, listen, we got to roll. We got to be finding opportunities to see how we get in where we fit in. Listen to this and do it the way he told you to do it. Everybody got their own lane to walk in. You don't have to do it the way I do it and I'm not supposed to do it the way you do it. But listen, you got to do something. <laughs> You got to get up and do something with your life for his mission. And so I've been in this place and I've just seen what God has been doing. The first time I went, I actually went into the place and I was supposed to just shadow somebody. But, you know, God got his own plan. I get there that day and the brother was like, hey, man, I got a couple people I need to meet at the gate and I got to do some other stuff. And so let me get you with the kids. And next thing I know, I'm in there and he closed the door. Boop. It's me and six kids. And God like, let's go. Next thing I know, the conversation got started, and it's an hour and a half later, the guard knocking at the door saying, man, you got five minutes. I'm like, that time went that quick, but God was like, I've been waiting to get to them. Listen, now you have a lot to say to them, I do. The conversation happened. I didn't have no notes. I didn't write nothing down. I went in there to watch, and God said, no, you came here to talk today. And listen to this. From that Bible study, the guards have been paying attention, and they've been funneling more young men. I have to go during their um, free time, so basically it's optional. So I go at 630, and they can play Madden, watch the game, the NBA playoffs is on. At this point right now, five weeks in, I got 17 young men out of 30 men that are in the max unit that's in the Bible study. Giving up free time to come talk about Jesus. And I'm like, Father, only you can do this. This is not me doing it. This is me being sent into a place that has been prepared for me to step into. And so I believe that Jesus wants to bring us to a space that we understand that you have a role and a responsibility to fulfill in the kingdom. And not only am I waiting on you, says Jesus, there's some other people waiting on you. So they travel by boat to get to this man, which is not in Jewish territory, is not the church, it's not a safe space. This man is over here living in the graveyard, naked, hurting himself, going through pain, and crying out. Just think about that. I believe that cry was a cry of agony to God, like, ah, is this it? Like, is this is where it ends for me? Like, is this is what life is all about? Is this is where we all going to wind up? And I believe God was saying from heaven, just hold on a second. <laughs> Jesus is on his way. <laughs> just hold on a second. I've been paying attention to all your cries. I've been bottling all your tears up. And I'm on my way to do something, listen to this, through my people. <laughs> I'm on my way to do something through a church that has been awakened to its purpose to say, yep, we come in. But listen to this. After we come in, we got to go. Not just go home, though we are going to go home. I got to go out of here with a mindset that Jesus want to use my boat this week. He might want to use my boat as soon as I leave out of the church. So I got to be paying attention and alert to the moments. Just yesterday, I'm on the airplane coming in. We got delayed in Dallas for a few minutes. And, you know, because I've been in Juvenile Hall, God had awakened this gift of rap in me. And I've been kind of writing some new stuff. I got a new CD about to come out. And so I wake up from the nap. And I start writing and finishing working on a song. The hostess walked by and asked me, what you doing? I'm like, well, you know, I'm a pastor and I do Christian rap. She said, oh. Next thing I know, thank you, brother. Next thing I know, I am rapping on the airplane. She get me the microphone. I'm standing up, listen to this, rapping about Jesus on the airplane. 
on the airplane, I'm giving information out. I'm telling people when the CD coming out. It's a young man I met who live in Grand Rapids, and he just came to the Lord a couple years ago. I'm going to go down and meet him and his family this week to hang out just because, listen to this, God said, I want to use you. It's your turn, man. Don't sit up in here and have all that rap in you, and you don't want to get, get up and start rapping right now. Just think, that's what he said. That's something in you that somebody going to identify with, but you so closed in trying to hold it to yourself. Man, pour that out. You don't know what I want to do with that. You got to lead the results up to me, says Christ. You got to get busy, though. You got to hunger and thirst to do his will. I just think it was me back here praying, God, use my life. Use me to be a witness. Use me to be uh, somebody that can help people see you. Use everything I got. I ain't going to throw the rap away. I'm going to keep the rap. And I use the rap. God, they say rap can't happen in the church, but everything, every good and perfect gift come from you. So use the rap. And now I get on the plane and God said, here we go. See, see, that's how he worked. When he get our prayers in alignment with his will, he will make stuff happen. And think about this. Then life becomes exciting. Listen to this, I ain't a star, but I feel like heaven is with me and watching my life, and they put me out on front street to do something for heaven, not me being seen for me. Look, he said, you want to be somebody? Come on with me. He said, I got a plan for your life. I got a purpose for your life. I got a destiny for your life, but I need you to wake up. Wake up to, listen to this, not just who you are, but whose you are. You go try to wrap something else using my gift, says God, doing something else, I'll shut it down. But if you go out here and do it for my name, this is why I open up doors, can't nobody shut on you. Whatever your thing is, he said, give it to me. <laughs> the little boy didn't know his lunch was going to do that that day. All I got is a little bit of bread, a little bit of fish. Jesus said, give that to me and watch what I do with it. <laughs> I, I will bless somebody with your stuff. You have been blessed to be a blessing. And so Jesus goes over to get this man who was on the edge of life, crying out, wondering what is it all about. And I believe Jesus at this moment is where the gospel rises in his own heart. Because he said, listen to this, they didn't put you out of the city. They didn't left you for dead. You over here hurting yourself in pain. This is where sin drives all of us. And Jesus said, listen to this, we about to trade places. In a minute, they're going to put me out the city. They're going to hurt me and hang me up and cut me and wound me, but I'm going to do it. He was wounded, the Bible says, for our transgressions. He said, I'm going to trade places with you. Listen to this. I'm going to die. The graveyard going to take me, but you go free. See, that's what Jesus want to do. And we are the witnesses to that message that where somewhere in your life you found out Jesus took your place. The path you was walking on, you didn't have to walk on that path no more. That path that the Bible says leads to destruction. There's a way that seems right to a man, but it ends in destruction. Jesus said, listen to this, I'm going to go take the destruction. Now you go on about your way, which is really my way. Live your life for my purposes. And so Jesus meets this man who is in a dead situation and changes things. What does he do to change things? Well, he takes everything that's in him and gets it out. Bible talks about those demons, the demon possession. The, the demons start talking out saying, Jesus, what, what you got to do with us right now? It ain't time yet. It, what, what you doing with us? You too early, Jesus. I know you coming back to make everything right, but we got time to mess up some stuff right now. Why are you messing with us now? And Jesus simply tells that legion, a multitude of things that was impacting this man, get out. Now the pigs is in the story, but it ain't really about the story so much. Really, what happens is what we see happen to the pigs. That which was in that man got off in them pigs, and it showed what it really was and what it was really trying to do, which is drive this man over the cliff and kill him. And just think, all of that was in that one man. All of that death and destruction and turmoil and frustration and misery and pain and angst was in that man, which is why he wasn't in his right mind. But Jesus came to get it out. <laughs> he came to set the captives free. There's a lot of people in this city that's chained up with a whole lot of stuff. And we're looking at them just on the natural level saying, man, they out of their mind. Now, maybe they in their right mind and they really got hurts and pains that ain't nobody answering right now. And they need God. The only one that can solve that problem is somebody got to bring Jesus to them. So that Je that's a quest for Jesus now. But grandma would say he was a doctor <laughs> that never lost the case. <laughs> Like, that he needs to be brought, and that's where we come in. We bring Jesus to people. We are his witnesses. 
And I just think about it that this man who had all of that in him, everybody doesn't rejoice when people get changed. There, there are systems that are built on human misery. The, 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 the justice system right now, there's a lot of people capitalizing off these unjust laws and these systems that have been created to put people behind bars and they sending their kids to college off somebody else's misery. And so they, and I just think about it, they, we've been doing some work at our church around human trafficking and prostitution. The, the pimps ain't happy when, 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 when the young ladies get rescued. There's a brother that's been doing a lot of stuff in Oakland, Pastor Rudy, and you know, he go up on the track and he go to talking and praying and preaching right on the track and the pimps be trying to flash guns and tell him to get out of there because they think this is their property. But he be out there, this is Jesus' property. <laughs> These young ladies belong to Jesus. And he go, now listen, everybody ain't supposed to go there, but somebody got to go. <laughs> and that's why Jesus will raise up a Pastor Rudy who got the boldness and the gift to be like, that's my assignment, I'll do it. We all got a lane and a role to fill, and we got to be asking, what is my lane that I might walk my lane, run my race, and do the thing I'm supposed to do? And so the people get say, Jesus, you, please leave the city. But I love what Jesus does. If you give me verse 14 right quick. Look at what Jesus does as this man is transformed. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. I just want to stop for a second. Now, remember, he was naked. He was a wild man coming out of the graveyard. It says once he came in contact with Jesus, once Jesus reached on the inside and set him free, it said that he was dressed and clothed in his right mind. He was dressed. Listen, I don't know where he got the clothes from. I don't know who brought the clothes, but listen to this. I believe one of the things he was dressed in was his true identity. He, he was restored back to who he really was. Think about the whole picture and story of the human race is this. Creation, everything is good. The fall, it just got bad. Redemption, Christ came to make it right again. Restoration, he's calling people into the work that Christ did so that they might be restored back in their right mind. He saw who he was because he saw who Christ was. And when Christ shows up, he reveals our identity, our purpose, who we truly are, not just what we do, but who we are. Like I am, at the base level, a son of God. I preach, I rap, I'm a father, I'm a pastor, I got a whole bunch of roles and titles, but at the base level, I am a son of God. I once was an enemy of God, <laughs> but through Christ, I've been brought back into sonship through the work of Christ. See, that's why the church is so, so a big key in this whole thing is that we have the revelation of what God is really trying to do. Jesus didn't come to get Rome out of power. He came to set the captives free. He didn't come to fix all of the laws and the unjust systems. He didn't come to get, 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 get uh, Rome and all of those people in Caesar. I ain't finna throw Caesar out of, the, out of the White House, so to speak. That ain't my issue right now. My kingdom ain't of this world. My kingdom happens in the heart. The kingdom of God is the rule and the reign of God in the heart of humanity. God got to get back in here. Else I can't even see straight. Everything's still cloudy. Remember the old school TVs when you had to have the antennas and, and put that aluminum foil on it to try to get that channel right? Some of y'all remember that. It's shh until you hit that knob right. That's what Jesus came to do. Your TV all messed up. Let me shh get that thing straight so you can see straight. The world is disfigured and disordered. Your life is disfigured. You think you all that. You ain't. Not till Jesus shh. You think that's what you're supposed to be. That's what life is all about. You got to have this. Get that. Go over there. Jesus said, not until I shh, fix your TV. And you're like, man, hold on a second. That's what this brother got. Because he said, Jesus, let me, let me come with you. And Jesus said, hold on. Shh. I don't need you to come with me. I'm finna go do my work. But it's some work that only you can do. He told that man, go to your house, to your friends, to your family, and tell them the good things that the Lord has done for you. He didn't send him off to seminary. 
He didn't send him off to a 12-week program. He didn't send him off into an in-depth Bible study. He said, go right now and start talking about what just happened. That's what Jesus said. You, you got enough in you right now to set somebody free. You got enough in you right now based on what I've done for you so far. Think about this. Not even what I have done for you, but now that your eyes are open, you see the stuff I didn't kept you from. The stuff that the enemy wanted to do to you to run you off of a cliff. You now see the stuff I didn't held back with my power. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie um, called Night and Day. A movie called Night and Day. Tom Cruise was in it. Somebody else, I don't forget the lady. But basically in this movie... He's a private eye, and he's caught up into something on this airplane, and an innocent lady get caught up in the situation with him. And now they're not only looking for him, but they're looking for her too. So he tells her this right here as they are now in a place of, well, we're going to separate or we're going to stay together. She want to go on her own because she's scared. But he says, your chances of making it without me, <laughs> but your chances of making it with me, that's Jesus saying to us, you without me ain't going to happen. <laughs> You with me, can't nobody stop you. There's some stuff after you and after me that we, don't, we can't fight it off. But with Jesus, listen to this, the gates of hell won't prevail against his church, not a building, but his people. <laughs> his people who go out in his name, he is with us and for us. So the question is, where is Jesus sending you today? To, to leave the gas station and go to the place he's calling you to simply tell him about the great things. Like on purpose, who at my job I have not really told about why I'd be so happy around here? Who at my job don't understand the joy, the stuff that has been carrying me through, the difficulties that we all going through, and they probably got questions in their mind about why I am still intact and everybody else losing their mind. I need to take somebody to lunch and just say, hey, I just want to tell you some stuff that's been going on in me and what God has been doing just so that they might know. Not so much about you, but about the God that is carrying you. This man is sent on a mission. This was that very verse I was writing on the plane as I get ready to close when the lady asked me and that got me put in the position to stand up rapping. We blessed to be a blessing, so we must go. We got a mission and a message that the world must know. Rain, sleet, or snow, driven by conviction. First was creation, the fall, then redemption. And now the restoration of all things is at hand. God got a plan, yep, and that's to draw man who be scattered in the land, closed off from the glory of the king, so lost. But there was no cost that Christ wouldn't pay for us. The death blow, it was coming, but he got in the way for us. Saved the day for us. So we got to tell it. Yeah, we got to tell it even if we got to yell it from the rooftops until the clock stops. Because the judgment of God is on simmer like a crock pot. And the devil trying to spot block, but he can't. When the saints be on their grind, man, in the paint. Go ye therefore compel the loss. Because it be life in Christ, you can meet me at the cross. Yeah. That's, that's our charge. It's to go out and tell people, man, I know it's a lot of issues. I know it's a lot of pain. I know it's a lot of hurt. I know you've done a lot of stuff. I know some stuff has been done to you, and I can't fix none of that, but come see a man. <laughs> That's what the lady did. <laughs> come see a man who told me everything about my condition and gave me answers to the million questions that I had that I was upset and frustrated about and giving myself away and not really understanding how precious I was. Listen, it is not to them, but to him. But everything changed when I... When I saw a man, Jesus wants to go. That's why he sends us. Just as the Father has sent me, says Jesus, so am I sending you. Father, we, um, we thank you. We thank you that you have invited us into mission. It's our boat, but it's really your boat. <laughs> Yes, yeah, our lives, we get to make decisions and it feels like we're in control, but this is why you call us to surrender. Our lives, our possession, our days, our time, our voices to your use because you can use them better than we can. You can get more out of them 
than we can get out of them trying to do it on our own. So, Father, would you help us all to come to that place of dying to ourselves, dying to our own will, that you might take up our lives? As you said in the word, that because you were going to the Father, that you would send the Spirit, and because of that, we would go and do greater works? We don't even know what that means, but we want to find out. <laughs> What does it mean for us, the church, to do greater works in this world that we go out on the campaign about the glory of the king and to see you set captives free? Father, would you fill us? Fill us with a sense of purpose, a sense of destiny, a sense of not wasting our lives, a sense of, of, of going into heaven exhausted, to going into heaven having done what you have created us to do. And Father, we might enter in, into your... Your, your, your glory with joy and peace. Father, these are your people. Would you breathe on them? Would you breathe on them, breathe in them from youngest to the oldest, God, that they will all see the spaces that they occupy that, that you want to enter into and do something new? That you want to you create a new fragrance in this city, God, that you want to bring about a new joy in the midst of the brokenness, God, that you want to do something that's not going to start in the public square. It's going to start through the hearts and mouths of your people. We have the word of life. Help us not to hold it within, but help us to speak it aloud. Raise this church into position, God, that you might get the glory out of their lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God. Give the Lord a hand. Praise. Amen. <laughs> Love. 
us for something else to stand on. Instead of God's word, God's truth, man's gone. And let's Christ snatching from the dark. Give him a changed heart and a brand new start. It's like Bart, he's at your stop, hop on. Man, the door's about to close, you ain't got long. My song, my joy, he's that. We be the 29th chapter of the book of Acts. Go ye, therefore, compelled to love. Cause it be life in Christ, you can meet me at the crowd. Keep washed in the blood, redeemed by the land. We all fail in Adam, but in him we stand. Go ye, therefore, compelled to love. Cause it be life in Christ, you can meet me at the crowd. Keep washed in the blood, redeemed by the land. We all fail in Adam, but in him we stand. Thank you.